Luke chapter 19. We've been looking at the life of Jesus. We've come all the way through the first three years of Jesus' life, and now we find ourselves in the last week of Jesus' life as we looked at last week. If you remember last week, Jesus, for the very first time, has proclaimed himself as the Messiah. Up until this point, the disciples uh, had become aware of who he was, as you, if you remember, that Peter, uh, a month earlier, had, had said, uh, Jesus, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. When Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And it was at that point that Peter says, you're the Christ. And then Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, Peter, but my father who's in heaven. The Messiah had come and no one knew except the 12. Now in chapter 19, Jesus makes that declaration as he comes riding in on a colt. It was the fulfillment of a prophecy written by Zechariah in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come entering into Jerusalem on a colt that had never been ridden. And Jesus does exactly that. The, the crowds are, are aware of what Jesus is proclaiming. They had seen the miracles that he had done. And this is, this is what's incredible. They start to shout out, Hosanna, Hosanna, who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna is, you know, this whole declaration that God save us. Save us. And, and guys, what, what's incredible is that the Pharisees are watching this and they are beside themselves. They're telling Jesus, Jesus, tell your disciples to stop it. And Jesus turns to the Pharisees that were in the crowd and he says, if these weren't declaring it, the very stones would be declaring it. The very creation would acknowledge who I am if the people that were present didn't. And it's at that is where we pick up from last week. Now, Verse 45, we're going to read verse 45 through verse 48 in Luke chapter 19, and then we'll come back and, and we're going to try to get all the way through chapter 20, verse 8. But notice what happens as we um, come to verse 45. It says, and Jesus went into the temple. He began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders and the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Now no, notice, notice what's happened up at this point. Jesus declaring, I'm the Messiah. And the first thing he does as the Messiah is he goes to the place of worship. And what he does in the place of worship is correct the wrongs that were transpiring in the place of worship. And, and it's fitting that, you know, Jesus would do exactly that. If he's the Messiah, then he's got to go to the place where people worship and say, look, this, this is wrong what you're doing. How you're representing God is tainted, it's twisted. Now, it's incredible because Matthew gives us a little more description of this particular place. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let me kind of back up a second. This was the second time that Jesus had went into the temple and, and cleaned uh, clean house. The first time was at the beginning of his ministry. In John chapter 2, we're told that Jesus went into the temple. He made a whip. And he literally started to chase the animals out and he began to overturn the tables. All of those who sold doves and were exchanging money inside the temple were chased off the precinct. That would have been three years earlier. At the beginning, same time of year, Passover. It's now three years later, Passover. And Jesus, as the first 
for the first time is acknowledging or declaring that he's the Messiah and he does it again. In other words, the first time they didn't heed him. And this time he comes back and he chases them off. Now, what's incredible in the passage is that Jesus is quoting two Old Testament passages and he combines them into one sentence. And those Old Testament passages are important passages because those passages are talking about why the temple would be there and then he's gonna talk about the problem with those inside the temple who are overseeing the temple. Now, let's talk a little bit about what all of this meant and, and, and what was transpiring in the temple. You see, at Passover, the, the population would swell to over 2 million people. And the reason that they would come was to worship God. Many from afar would bring their animals, their, their sacrifices to be offered up at the temple mount and there on the altar before God. Every male was required to give a half a shekel for the upkeep of the temple according to the scriptures. And so as they would come, they would, they would have their little, you know, money saved up so that they can give it to the, the upkeep of the temple. It was a half a shekel, but here's what would happen. The money changers would be in the, in the temple precinct there at the court of the Gentiles, and what, this is what they would do. They would take the Roman coins or the foreign coins that would have the God or, or, the, or the, the Caesar or the, or the ruler imprinted on that coin, and the Jews considered that idolatry. It was an image, and because that image was on there, they couldn't accept it inside the temple precinct as an offering to God and for the work of God. And so what they would do is they'd say, okay, we gotta turn your Roman coin into a Jewish coin, which is a shekel. But if you're gonna turn your Roman coin into a Jewish coin, we're gonna charge you an exorbitant amount of money in order to exchange your coin. They were taking advantage of the people. That, 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 the, the whole thing was, is that we're, we're gonna, we're gonna extort those that are coming to worship God for our own gain and for our own benefit. The same thing would happen with the sheep or the lamb. You see, they would bring their lamb or their sheep from home. And, and some of them would, you know, travel long distance. So we'll, just, we'll just buy it when we get there. When they get there, if they brought their own, the priest would inspect that lamb or that dove. And if, if it had any blemish on it, if it had any kind of defect that had any kind of marking that would deem it unclean then it would say well you know what you got an unclean animal there you can't offer that but if you go over to the court of the gentiles where they're selling sheep there's some pre-approved ones over there and you can buy one from them and then you can worship you can offer it to god as an act of your worship and so in order for men to obey god they had to pay these exorbitant prices as part of their worship. And Jesus looks at all of this and he goes, what are you guys doing? He takes a cord and he chases it out the first time. The second time he just walks in, he just starts flipping tables and he clears the cord of the Gentiles. Now, when I told you there was two verses, the first one is Isaiah 56, 7. If you'd like to turn there, I'd invite you to. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. Watch what happens here as God is explaining his heart when it comes to his temple. Notice what it says, Isaiah 56, 7. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain. Who's, he, who's the them? It's the Gentiles the nations of the world watch this even them I'll bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar watch this for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, yet I will gather to him others beside those who are gathered to him. Papa. Guys, here, here was the deal. Here was, here was the thing. There was the holy place 
That's where the priest was only allowed to go once a year to bring the blood of a, of a, of a lamb to sprinkle it, and that was for the offering of sin. That was the holy place. No one went into the holy place except for the high priest. Then there was the outer courts, and that's where the Jews would go and they would offer their sacrifices. It's where all the Jews would gather to worship God. But outside the outer courts, no gen- inside the, 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 the holy place, no Gentile was allowed. See, there was a special court for Gentiles. It was called the court of the Gentiles. And it was where the Gentiles were to be able to come and they were to bring their offering. They were to worship God in that place. And the Jews, rather than having a place for the Gentiles to come, they had turned it into a marketplace. There was, a, it was, there was so much hustle and bustle and, and trading and noise going on that someone couldn't even pray there because there was animals and, and money changers and noise and all of the distractions. They had overtaken that place as a place of merchandise rather than a place of prayer. And the Jews could care less because it didn't affect them and it, and, it, and it didn't impact their worship of God. It only impacted the Gentiles' worship of God. And Jesus comes in and he chases them all out. And he says, you guys have taken the, what was supposed to be a house of prayer. And what did he do? He says, you turned it into a den of thieves. You guys are just here to, to extort people. You're ripping everybody off. You guys are a bunch of robbers is what he's declaring to those religious leaders of that day. The second passage is exactly that. And I'm gonna ask you again, everyone, turn your Bible to Jeremiah chapter seven. Man, this is heavy because it's where Jesus is quoting out of. But when you read the context of it, man, it's, it's incredible. Jeremiah chapter seven. We're going to read a good portion of this, so we're going to start in verse 1. Watch what it says. Jeremiah chapter 7, look at verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Where is that? That's the temple that Jesus is at. And proclaim there this word. Say, Hear the word of the Lord, all of you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings. And I will cause you to dwell in this land. When God says amend your ways, what he's telling them is repent. Turn from what you're doing. Amend, fix something. That's the idea of amending. He says amend your ways and your doings and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. And then he says, look at verse four. Do not trust in these lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And here was the thing, man. The Jews thought, because I go to the temple and I worship God, I've done my duty, but now I can live my life however I want to live my life. And they were put, they had a false sense of security. That's what, that's what Jesus, that, that's what Jeremiah was telling them. And Jesus is quoting out of this passage. You have a false sense of security because just because you go to the temple to worship, it doesn't mean you have a license to go out and live like a dog. And that's exactly what they were doing. He's saying, you got to repent. That means turn from your old life, from your sin, right? And then watch, look at the next verse. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever, forever and ever. Verse eight, behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. No, notice what Jesus is saying. You guys are believing a lie. You're believing a lie if you think that you just go to the temple and fulfill your obligations and then you can walk away from the temple and you can continue to live in rebellion to God. That's a lie. And then notice he, he, he takes that, in, in that and, he, and he begins to define it in verse nine where he says, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, Swear falsely, burn incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom you do not know and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by your name and say, we're delivered to do all these abominations. 
Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? That's the passage he quoted. Has this house that's called by my name become a den of thieves? And Jesus is telling the Pharisees and he's declaring to all the religious leaders in his day that you guys are hypocrites. You're, you're being duplicit in your life. You're acting one way in front of people, but you're acting differently. And it's all about your greed and your, your pursuits and your lust and your wants, but yet everyone else thinks that you're, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're spiritual and that you're holy, but you're just playing a game. And this is the heavy part, guys. Look at the next verse. Well, good, verse 12. But go now. No, no, verse, verse 11. I skipped the whole verse. Has this house who's been called by name become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, watch this. I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. God goes, I see through it, all of it. You're not fooling me. You can fool everybody else, but you're not fooling me. And that's what God, and then he says this, but go now to my place that was in Shiloh where I was, where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people, Israel. If you go back to the book of 1 Samuel, Shiloh is where God had the tabernacle set up. And it's where the Ark of the Covenant was. But Eli, the high priest at that time, had two boys, and his two boys were living rebellious against the Lord. They were, they were just ripping off the people. They were sexually immoral with the women at the temple. They, they, were, they were just acting like, like dogs. And, and because of it, God brought judgment upon the children of Israel, and the ark was taken by the Philistines, and Israel was under siege, and they were destroyed. Now, think, think, think about what Jesus is declaring. He's telling the children of Israel, you know, what happened to Shiloh is going to happen to you. Be, because you're not representing God rightly, man, I, I'm, I'm going to send a destruction upon the land. We, we know because we're on this side of history, we know that 38 years later, the Romans would come in and they would destroy Jerusalem and they would destroy the temple because those who were entrusted with caring for it had become self-centered rather than other-centered. And they didn't care about the Gentiles, they only cared about themselves. Now watch, go, go back to Jeremiah now. I mean, to Luke now, I'm sorry. Go back to Luke. Jesus took Genesis 56 and he took Jeremiah 7 and he, and he combined them into that one sentence. And then it tells us in verse 47, and here's heavy, guys, watch what he says. And he, Jesus, was teaching daily in the temple. Guys, Jesus took over the temple. He chased out the money changers. He's there in the court of the Gentiles and every day he was teaching in the temple. Luke Matthew in this same account tells us that the lame and the blind had come to the temple every day and Jesus would heal them. Unreal. Now watch, go, go down to um, go, go, go down to verse 47 again, it says he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priest, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy Jesus and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Now, d d d check this out, guys. The religious leaders were... looking to have Jesus killed as a result of it. Does, does that blow your mind? Does it blow my mind? No, no, th think, think about what's happening. 
finally people are coming into this place of the Gentiles. The lame people are walking. They'd walk in limping, they'd walk out rejoicing. The blind people would walk in with a cane, they'd walk out seeing, and the religious leaders were furious because of it. They wanted to kill Jesus as a result of it. Is there something wrong with that picture? Seriously. Is there something wrong with that picture, guys? Shouldn't it be the heart of God? It shouldn't it be the heart of God's people to go, man, we want to see people's lives changed and life, people's, people's lives bettered as a result of, of knowing God? But instead of becoming an instrument for God, they become an obstacle for the people to come to God. What a sad, what a sad state. Well, what, what a sad predicament. And yet, here, here Jesus is, 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 you know, every day waking up, teaching the people. And, and the Pharisees are just going, man, what, 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 what Jesus is doing, he's undermining our authority, he's undermining our position, and he's affecting our pocketbook. And because of it, they're saying, did this just get Jesus out of here? How, how do we kill him? How do we destroy him? How do we remove him? Because he's messing up our, our gig. And, and it's Jesus is doing that on a daily basis. The Pharisees are plotting their whole, their, this whole scene. And then we come to chapter 20. And here's the confrontation that takes place. Look at chapter 20. We're going to take the first eight verses. We'll read them together. And it happened on one of those days. As Jesus taught the people in the temple and he preached the gospel that the chief priests and the scribes together with the elders confronted him. And they spoke to him saying, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? Notice the question they're asking. Who gave you the right to do what you're doing, Jesus? Who, 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 who do you think you are? <laughs> That's really what they're asking. And what they were asking is, who, who will give you the right to come riding in on that donkey, for everyone to be throwing their palm branches down at you, for everyone to be crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, for you to come and overturn the tables and chase out the money changers, and for you to come here every day and begin teaching. Who gave you the authority to do these things? And I, and I, and I think it, 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 was, it was a valid question. Because it was the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests that had been given authority over the temple mount and over the worship of God. And so they come to Jesus and they said, Jesus, who gave you the authority to do the things that you're doing? Now, it wasn't an honest question. It was a fair question, but it wasn't an honest question. It wasn't an honest question because, you see, they knew why he had the authority. He had fulfilled prophecy after prophecy. He had healed thousands upon thousands of people that had come to him. Anyone who was honest would, would have to come to the conclusion that this guy is sent from heaven and that God is working in his life. You would have to come to that conclusion. And everything he was declaring came from the word of God. And so when they asked the question, Jesus, who, who, who gave you the authority to do the things that you're doing and to say the things that you're saying? And what they were attempting to do at this point was to get the crowd to go, hey, yeah, well, you know, who, who gave you the authority? What rabbi you know, put their stamp of approval? Or what piece of paper do you have that declares that you have the right to do the things that you're, that, that you're doing? And Jesus would turn around and rather than answer the question, he would ask them a question. And, and I love that Jesus would do that. We'll see Jesus do that on a couple other occasions. Uh, in, in the next few weeks, he's going to, rather than answer a question, he's going to find out, are you sincere in your question? Or are, you just, are you just trying to uh, trap me? And notice what Jesus does there in verse 3. Jesus answered and he said to them, I also will ask you one thing. And you answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from man? The baptism of John, was, was that a God thing or was that a, a man thing? 
No, notice their, their, their reasoning, verse five. And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? And if we say from men, then all the people will stone us for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from, liars. Verse eight. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You see, their, their, whole, their whole reasoning was, we're, we're gonna find out what, what the most politically correct answer to this question is so that we don't get in trouble. <laughs> that, was, that was really their conclusion. Because if we say that, that John the Baptist, who everyone knew was a prophet that had come and declared uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, if, if they say that he was from men, the people would turn on them. If they said he was from heaven, then Jesus would say, then why don't you believe John? It was John the Baptist who said this, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps are not worthy to loose, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan into his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor and gather the wheat into its barn, and the shaft he will burn with an unquenchable fire. That was John the Baptist, and he was referring to Jesus. And so they, they, they were trapped. They were trapped. If they said John was a prophet, then John declared Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the one that was going to clean house, then why won't you believe him? And if they said it was from men, they, they, would, they, they would get stoned because everyone in the crowd knew that John had come from, from God and that his ministry was from heaven. And they were more concerned about a political answer than they were about truth. That was the problem. And I think, guys, it's what you and I have to face in the days that we're living in. Are we going to be more concerned about truth and the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives than we are about what man thinks or what man says because th think about this, if they truly believed that Jesus was a false prophet, they had a responsibility to warn the people that he was a false prophet, no matter what the consequences were. But they weren't willing to do that because it was all about me. And, and I, I wanna tie this all together for us this morning because I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a heavier kind of implication in this whole passage because everything that Jesus has declared, what, what this all was about was the authority that Jesus possessed. And if it's all about the authority that Jesus possessed to do the things that he said and the things that, 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 that he was doing, then we have to ask the question, what kind of authority does Jesus have in my life? Is he really the authority that I hold to? Here's, here, here's, here's, here's the fact of the matter, guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God lives inside of you. If you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you said, God, I'm a sinner, I, I, I want to be forgiven for that sin, I want to invite you to come in and, and live in my life, what, that, what you've declared is that my life doesn't belong to me. Watch, I, I, want, to, I want to ask you to turn there. First, first Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 19 and 20. Check this out. Do you not know that your body is the temple, the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, Christian. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He bought you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus was concerned about a physical temple and all of the, the implications and all of the immorality and all of the conniving that was taking place and all the selfish ambition that was happening inside that temple, how much more do you think he's concerned about your temple? If you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what kind of authority does he have in your life? Does he really rule in your life? Or, or, or is it just something we say he does, but he really doesn't? D does this take precedence over what man says and, and what man thinks? God's word. 
Because if Jesus has the authority over your life, like he like he's walks into this temple and has authority over that place, I mean, you know, how much more so should that be true in, in our life? And if we're walking around going, oh yeah, I, I go to church every week and you know, I, 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 I give my tithe and I, and, I, and I sing my worship songs, but then I walk around and I live like the rest of the world lives, do you think that that's really something that God looks down on and he's pleased with? Seriously? There's no difference. What was happening then and what's happening now? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what, what's, 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 what's fascinating in this whole picture is that Jesus is rebuking the religious leaders because they were in control of that temple. And the only one in control of your temple is you. And you're gonna be held accountable for your responsibility of this temple just like they were held responsible for the temple that they were responsible for. And Jesus concerned about what? The lost. The unbeliever. It was a place where the Gentiles would, would travel to come and just to come and spend some time to get to know the God of, of heaven. And if you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you become that same, you have that same purpose. They were to be declaring the God of heaven to a world that's lost. It's in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that, that Paul would say these words. Check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He told us in 1 Corinthians that we're t the temples of the Holy Spirit and that we're brought at a price. But watch what he says in verse 2. Look at verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the one where the aroma of death leading to death and to the other where the aroma of life leading to life who is sufficient for these things. Wow. He says, don't, don't you realize that it's from your life that the fragrance of Christ is dispensed? It's from your life that the knowledge of God is to be proclaimed to the Gentiles that don't know God. And for some, we're, we're the fragrance of life and to some, we're the fragrance of death. To those who reject Christ, they, they look at you, they smell you, they see you, they watch you, they go, man, there's something different in your life that, that just, I, I, it, it makes me aware that I'm far from God. That, that's really what your fragrance should be. Your, your, your fragrance should be, man, if I don't get right with God, I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna be, um, it's gonna lead to death because I see what someone who's following after God looks like. But to others, you're the fragrance of life because they, they see you and they smell you, they taste you, they look at you, they, they go, man, there's something about you and I want it. I want it because you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's, and it's the heart of God that you and I would be a place where people come to find knowledge and truth and they see life, they see difference, they see everything that, that, that transpires when someone has, has surrendered his life to God. And what's amazing in this particular passage, guys, notice what Jesus says at, at the very end of, of this verse in, in chapter 20, there in verse seven, he says, he answered that they did not, they answered that they don't know what, where it was from. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And here was the heavy thing. Jesus says, look, if you're not going to be real with me, man, I'm not going to be real with you. If you're not, if you, if you, if you're not going to be honest, and you're, you're, you're not going to be candid, and you're, you're just not going to say, okay, here's here, here's what it is. If you're just playing a game, you know, God, God, this is what Jesus said to them. Look, I, I'm not going to tell you where my authority comes from. I'm not, because you really don't even want to know. 
You have no real desire to know where that authority comes from. You're just looking for a way out. You're just looking for an excuse. You're just looking for a way to say, well, I, I, I tried that Jesus thing and it didn't work, so I'm gonna go try it. You, you, see, no, you see, it comes to this place where you come and just say, you know what, God, you're right, you're true, your authority is, 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 is been declared, it's evident, I can't deny it, and, and what, what, all I can do is acknowledge that you're the king and you're the one who has authority over everything and I come and I surrender my life to you. And once you do that, man, then Jesus will begin to reveal the next step to you and he'll begin to reveal his heart to you. And it's not until then that that happens. And this is incredible, man, because the next passages, guys, I'm going to ask you to read ahead for next week, verses 9 to verse 19. We're going to cover that whole section next week because Jesus gives a parable, and that parable is about those who were entrusted with the, the responsibilities that were given, and then they, they were unfaithful in it. Incredible parable Jesus gives next week. I, 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 I can't even... I can't even wait to, to get into that text because it, it, it's just, it just fascinates me how Jesus was just gonna, gonna just cut him to the heart. He's gonna be very candid with, with those who had been given this responsibility. But I think the, the real question that we walk away with is, man, is Jesus really the authority in our lives? Is his word really the authority in your life? If you claim to be a Christian this morning, man, does he really rule and reign over your temple? Honestly, it, there's this word, when, 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 when God defines why we're here, do you find that for your life in the scriptures? When he defines your identity, your sexuality, your decision making, your, your course, I mean, do, 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 you, do you look to the world to, to do that? Do you look to yourself to do that or do you look to the word of God to do that? Because if God has the authority in your life, then his word takes precedence over everything else. And it's that authority that he's wanting to, to declare in that temple, but I think not just in that temple, but in our temple, in our lives. He wants to have the authority, but you have to give it to him. And Father, we thank you for this morning and for your word. We thank you for, man, what, what, a, what an incredible passage, Lord, that Lord, you would just go in to, to, this, to this place and, and just establish that what you say is right, no matter what anyone else says, even the religious leaders. And Lord, many of us have that obstacle that we have to choose what, what religion says over what you say. And God, may, may that always be a no-brainer. God, what you say supersedes anything that a man would say or religion would say, that your word is truth. And Lord, I pray, God, that that would be true for every one of us, that, Lord, your word would, would be elevated in our lives and what you declare would be what guides us and directs us and what establishes us. Lord, truth in our lives. And Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, if there's any of us here that have never declared that, that you're the king and the Lord and you have the authority over my life, I surrender it to you. I pray today would be the day, God, where that life would be changed and that, God, you would do a great work, Lord, in this place right now. We ask for your Holy Spirit just to fall upon us and that you would have your way in us. Lord, we ask for you to Lord, just go before uh, this, 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 this moment, Lord. And just before we conclude and before we close, maybe this, this, this morning, man, God's speaking to you. You realize that, that he hasn't been my authority. I'm just gonna be honest. He hasn't been the one who I seek wisdom from and direction from and clarity from that I, I've been living my life under my own authority or under the world's authority, whatever someone else has declared, but I haven't done what God has declared. And today I want to change that. You see, all, all, all that's necessary is that you come to that conclusion and then you say, God, I give, I surrender. I want to ask you to come in and be my king and I want to ask you to reign over my life. That's as simple as it gets, guys. There's no hoops to jump through. There's, there's, no, there's no church to sign up to be part of. There's no membership that you gotta, you gotta check into. It's just a matter of God, I want you to be my Lord. 
I want you to guide my life. I, I, I don't want anyone else or anything else to do that. I want you to be the one. And I want your word to take that place in my life. I want you to have the authority in everything I do. You see, that's what a disciple of Jesus declares. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, what anybody else says. It's not about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not about your children. It's not about your mom and dad. It's about you and God and saying, God, I give. I don't want to live in rebellion anymore to you. I want to be under your rule and under your authority.